Um, hi, so I'm Shuri Atchison. Um, I am a software engineer with Kianos, and I am the founder of Women Who Code UK. Um, I'm going to let my panel introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Elena Percival, and I'm the CEO of Women Who Code, an organization dedicated to inspiring women to excel in technology careers. We're currently in 12 countries and have more than 10,000 members. Um, my name is Emma Mulqueeny, and I run <coughs> Rewired State and Young Rewired State, where we work with um, thousands of developers on hacks and modding days with organizations in Young Rewired State, where we find all of those kids that are in their bedrooms teaching themselves how to program and um, bring them all together and introduce them to open data and real world challenges. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary McKenna. Um, I co-founded a um, successful e-learning business based up in Derry, uh, Learning Pool, um, and I am presently rather unusually for a tech entrepreneur, actually. I'm working in one of the big national charities on an interim assignment, uh, and I'm heading up um, a micro-working platform, which is a social innovation project, and it's called Task Squad. Okay, so um, I think there's a view, obviously, that in order to be in tech, you have to come from a certain background. Um, I have came through the standard way. I've done computer science, and I'm now a software engineer. But I'd like to hear the ladies what their background is and how they've came into tech. Mary? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, my perspective on this is there are an awful lot of um, employment opportunities for women in tech that don't involve you actually being a coder. So my own background is I started life as, oh, I don't, really, I don't really ever tell anybody this, so, you know, switch the stream off for a second. But I started life as an accountant. But I went over to the dark side and moved into sales. And tech sales is a fantastic career for girls and women. It really is. It's a brilliant space to be in. Um, and so that's, that's my background. Um, my, my dad, for my sins, um, is a computer scientist and a mathematician, so when I grew up, we used to do maths and computing for fun, um, which was cool <laughs> sometimes. Um, and so it's kind of something I've just grown up knowing how to do in the same way that you learn to read and write. So it's always kind of been like the, the, the backbone, I guess, of my life and the thing that I have actually kind of chosen to do for fun. And I mean, I haven't written a line of code for a great many years now, um, but I do understand Boolean theory and I do understand, um, you know, what everybody's doing. Um, but I have always... You know, my friends are all geeks, <laughs> and um, communication is my thing. And so um, I've kind of always migrated towards the um, tech world in my um, social life, as well as my business life. But um, I still identify as a, um, as a woman in technology, even though I don't actually write programs anymore. So I actually came from the footwear industry. <laughs> I worked for Puma for three years at the beginning of my career. Uh, working in marketing, and then I worked for a small women's performance footwear company where I launched the first ever women-specific volleyball and basketball shoe. During that time, um, Nike and Mizuno were my biggest competitors, and I was mm. working at a $15 million a year company, and so I had to learn to be agile, which helped me when I transitioned into the tech industry. I started off doing marketing there as well, and I felt that learning to program was going to be beneficial to my career, and so I began to get more and more involved in it, and I absolutely fell in love with, um, with the community, and now I've made that my career. Um, so what I want to talk about is each of us does something that brings back to the community, and whether it's through Women Who Code, Rewired State, and Task Squad, and I just want to know, why does the economy need this? Why do we need all of these different groups, and what do they actually bring to the economy and to the table? Emma? Um, well, I think, I mean, certainly what we do in Young Rewired State with um, young people is that, um, see, I, I discovered in 2009 that um, we weren't teaching um, kids how to code anymore in schools. This isn't just something that's, you know, in the UK. This is around the world. People just kind of stop teaching um, programming. And um, it took me a long time to kind of find 50 kids, 
if you could program, and it was literally one child at a time, you know, getting them out of their bedrooms and telling everybody, finding all of those terrified mothers who thought that their child was doing something horrific, um, when in fact all they were doing was kind of teaching themselves how to program. And um, so by, by finding these kids back in 2009, just this 50 and bringing them together, this the community um, aspect to it, so meeting each other, meeting other kids that um, did this, that were teaching themselves how to code, um, meant that those ones that were that had felt isolated and um, were I mean, quite often bullied and um, sort of starting to retreat into themselves, um, by putting them into this community, first of all, it meant that they were um, naturally going to compete and they were going to become even better programmers, which is amazing. Um, but also it meant that they were going to actually stick with programming and that they were going that they valued their skills and that other people would value the skills um, that they had and then they would also equally share. So I think, you know, from, from a kind of business and economy point of view, you know, it's, it's taken six years to find 1,200 kids, which is where we are at the moment, which is still not awesome, but it's good. And, um, and also to kind of take this around the world. But, you know, we're, we're getting them younger and so therefore the gender balance is, is getting better. So we've got, you know, young girls. Um, joining and, and playing and learning. Um, but, you know, ultimately, these kids are going to be able to support all of the teaching in schools. They're going to be able to share their skills. And, um, of course, they're going to be working in um, industry in, you know, well, some of them are kind of popping out of university now. Some of them are not bothering to go to university and, um, and starting to take up jobs. And immediately, that's going to have a big difference on... Um, the way that we do things across the board, not just in computer science. So I think from a kind of skills and jobs point of view, it's hugely important. So Mary, why do we need TaskQuad? I'm going to talk about learning pool first, if I might, yeah, sure. uh, Sherry. I mean, um, for the economy here in Northern Ireland, um, learning pools are, is a great local success story because 99% of the customers are from outside of Northern Ireland. So it means that we bring new money into our economy. Um, the other thing that I do, apart from actually going and starting businesses myself, is I chair Northern Ireland's Digital Circle, which links back to something that Emma has just said there about creating that community of people that can help each other. So our mission is to help people that are in their bedrooms starting to code or creating websites or launching their gaming business. We help those guys to find each other so that they can join up and and work on bigger projects together. So I think that links back into stuff that the mayor was saying earlier today about how um, Northern Ireland has a really fast growing knowledge economy. So supporting, you know, Digital Circle plays a really key part in supporting that and I'm very proud that I'm part of that. Um, so um, Women Who Code addresses the women in tech issue on three different levels. And in case you haven't heard what I'm talking about, um, Women aren't a minority, but we are in the tech industry. And so when I refer to um, the women in tech issue, that's what I'm referring to. Um, we help women find an avenue into technology, and because unfortunately women did, didn't, girls didn't necessarily grow up feeling as though tech was an avenue for them. So not enough of them at least. And we also address we're a community for women who are in industry um, to have a voice to, to deal with day-to-day -day issues. Um, and then we give them tools to um, enhance their career. So when it comes time for someone to get a promotion, hopefully it will be them. Awesome. Okay, so I think a lot of the questions here are addressed towards there's not enough jobs and there's not enough women in those jobs. So in the UK alone, there is a 44K shortfall of UK STEM graduates. Now up until, it's statistically shown that um, girls do better in STEM subjects until they reach A-level age and then they branch off into medicine and law and they don't choose computer science. Um, only 23% of computer science graduates are female. And I wonder if you have any opinions on why that is. Um, is there any issues that do you think that has caused this and that we have now missed out on so many generations of young girls? Mary? I mean, I think it's, I think it's a terrifying statistic and hopefully it's on a, an improving trajectory. Um, I think that a lot of what people do in a well-meaning way accidentally 
puts off girls from tech careers or from pursuing uh, an academic technology stream, um, even to the extent of like the BBC trying to be helpful by having people like you know, Brian Cox or Dara Brain or whatever, but it ends up coming across as being quite laddish and it puts girls off. So, I mean, I do think that this is it's an emerging issue and it's something that will resolve itself in time, but everybody needs to be doing something to try and accelerate that, I think. Uh, stuff like what Emma's, you know, what mm. Emma's doing and what Elena's doing are really, really helpful. Mm. I think, um, I mean, the only time I've ever really experienced um, discrimination, I guess, against um, being a female technologist was when I was at school. You know, um, my my mates were horrible to me because I was this <laughs> kind of geeky kid, and I know that that's not just girls. You know, boys get that as well. But um, but it was horrific. But but also, absolutely no job opportunities were offered to me that were in the tech industry. And I have two daughters now, one's 16 and one's 12, and so my 16-year-old is obviously going through that kind of, you know, going to all of the career advice days and doing all of the online things. Kind of, what shall I be? And still there's no technology options that are given to her and um, and so I think actually it starts at school and you know sort of right from um, from very young and I, and I just think they just don't see it as an option and there is the kind of bro grammar culture which is mm. just grim no mm. one really wants to get into that they're just not fun but um, uh, but yeah I, I think it's kind of you know, it's worse at school, which is just crazy. It makes it very difficult to kind of, you know, actively do things about that. But we can all do it, but just we just need to kind of be aware, as you say, it's kind of be aware and um, and actively take steps in what you yeah. do to, to kind of change mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I will, I will point out that it was recently announced that in the United Kingdom, programming is going to be taught in schools. and. Um, because of these statistics, it's imperative that uh, programming is taught at the elementary school level to all genders and to all income levels if we're going to hope to see a change in the future. I've spent two and a half years um, getting women into programming and any woman who's even had one class, one period of exposure to programming prior to coming to Women Who Code, she learns faster. And so I ask that all of you have um, your daughters or your friends' daughters take one programming class. Um, I just want to pick up on something Emma said about the programmer culture. Um, I don't know if everyone is aware of everyday sexism, um, which is been picked up by The Guardian and various other things where women write in or tweet in stories of sexism in their industry. Um, on Ada Lovelace Day, um, we were supposed to send in <coughs> positive things that have happened to you in the industry and unfortunately the majority of things that were sent in were negative sexist remarks that men had made to women in the IT industry. As well as that, um, a new magazine has came around called Hot Tech Today. If you haven't heard of this, if you Google hottechtoday.com, it'll come up right away. It's a lad magazine associated with tech. So you can vote in your hot tech hottie, which is a lady in tech um, who will walk around in whatever you want her to walk around in and read you stories in tech on their podcasts. Um, the female founder has openly um, said that it is a positive thing and that everybody loves naked ladies, so why not have naked ladies in tech? Um, exactly, I like that someone tied it there. Um, what is your opinion on this? And do you think this negatively affects a young girl when she sees this sort of um, rubbish being put out to the next generation? Emma? Yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't know, it just kind of defies the kind of logical thought that everybody has nowadays. You know, it's kind of like sexism and racism and all of those isms, you know, that we just assume um, just, you know, have kind of been bred out now. You know, this doesn't happen anymore. And so when new things like that happen, it's just insane. And you can't, you can't kind of find any logic behind it. And I think, I mean, I always go back to logic, but that's because I have a kind of programming mind. But, but it is, you know, when, when you can't find that kind of logical way through it, it makes it very difficult to explain it to, um, to young girls. And I've also heard um, people suggesting that, um, you know, good ways to get young girls into um, technology is to have, you know, some hot young thing kind of being the, 
um, a lead technologist for them to aspire to, like a kind of a geeky Miley Cyrus. And it's, what? I don't understand that. It's kind of why, you know, you don't, you don't need to have this, this thing, you know. It's kind of people want to do things because they're fun, they're interesting, and they're going to make money. And maybe they'll get famous, but not so they can take their clothes off mm -hmm. and strut around. I know with women who code, you actively promote strong women. Um, do you have any <coughs> opinion? Yeah, well, one, I would say that that show probably sells because of sex and tech yeah. just happens to be um, the niche that she's gone after. Um, unfortunately, I, that makes me very sad that, that um, she's positioning that into, into tech. Um, we are a place where women can come in and talk about the, the issues that they face from day to day. And what I've seen is that it's, it's not something big that happens. It's the little things, usually just the unprofessional things um, that happen on a day to day basis where if we talk about it and we address it faster before it becomes an issue, then you can move forward in your career and actually the team around you can be more supportive um, to you in what your needs are. And it's unfortunately these little things that often get internalized because if you say them out, out loud, they, they just seem really small and why would you even talk about it? But they, they do matter. And so Women Who Code does provide a place for you to talk about these issues and, and, and deal with them. And um, you know we, we are women in tech and that is our career and women who are cute Miley Cyrus geeks and women who are the exact opposite are all welcome. <laughs> I don't have a great deal to add to what my panel colleagues have said. I find that, I find a magazine like that deeply saddening and I'm guessing that the person that's founded it just sees it as a way of making money. Mm -hmm. um, One of the points that was made on the Guardian article on this site was that is it not just as demeaning to men to assume that they need a naked woman to focus on a tech issue? Because if that's the case, then we're clearly saying that men can't focus unless there is a naked lady in front of them. And that is equally as sexist and insulting as it is to the women who are fighting against this and trying to prove that, no, we're not just there for the titillation. We're not just there to be boost babes. We all have equal things to say. And it's all obviously just as important as what anyone else is saying here. So I think that was a really good point to me, that it, is, it can be flipped and it is equally as sexist what she is doing. And a lot of men are not going to read this and not going to buy it because they are insulted that it's insinuated that that's what they need to be interested in a tech story. Um, I know me and Alana both run um, gender specific events for people who identify as female in Women Who Code UK and Women Who Code work Worldwide. Um, do you think there's a place for this here or are we actually holding us back by segregating us more? Or what do you think, Mary? Do you think that there's a place for gender specific I, I, events? I think there is a place for it, yes. Yeah. I definitely do. I mean, I think some of the stuff that uh, Elena just articulated there about the sorts of people that, that join Women Who Code, I think it's an encouraging environment that gr helps people grow. I, I also think, you know, for women in tech, because you're a scarce resource, it's also an opportunity. I've never had any I've never had any problems getting on, and I think that's because there aren't that many of us around. So, you know, mm. make hay while the sun shines. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, you know, I do, I do experience a lot of positive things, but I think um, that's also because I have quite a forceful nature, and, um, and, I'm, and I'm an entrepreneur, and so I definitely kind of, you know, benefit from, from you know, being one of very few. But what I can do is, you know, go to gender specific events like ones that you hold and talk to other women like that so that you know they can see that perhaps you know even if they're not kind of entrepreneurs and they're not kind of forceful that they can still do some kind of fun stuff so i think there's a role for it but it's i, I hope there's not a role for it forever i really do mm. but it was really good yesterday when you invited men to come in and and to talk about stuff it's good yeah I definitely look forward to the day that it's not needed, but for the majority of us in the workplace and at um, events, they tend to be overwhelmingly um, male. And so it creates a community for us and it helps us foster and support each other and allow leaders to emerge from a women's community. And then we, we, don't, we don't not in integrate with um, 
men on, on a day-to-day -day basis. It just gives us a couple nights per month where we're supporting each other. I totally agree. Um, I'm very proud, personally, that Women Who Code Belfast had our first male speakers last night in the form of Brewbot and our first male attendee in a room of women um, who very much enjoyed the session and learned just as much as any woman that was there. And that point is, um, we are not going to stop men learning at our events. It's not a sexist thing. It's just, as Alanis Erlina said, it's just a place to come and get together with other women that are similar to you whenever we're surrounded by men the majority of our day. Um, sometimes the point is made that gender-specific events are sexist and we are depowering men when we are trying to empower women. Is it, that is obviously not the case as what we have just explained, but is it possible for men to be part of this problem and help us decrease the women in tech issue without feeling some sort of misplaced gender guilt and not feel that it is an issue just on all men? Is that possible for us to do? I don't know if it's possible. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, I think the gender guilt is, is definitely there because, you know, there are so many fabulous guys who are kind of really working hard to um, kind of bring more girls into the industry. And unfortunately, and they're the ones that will come to um, Women Who Code events and who will come to events like this and will kind of chat to women like us. And, you know, and it's the dudes that are... Um, <coughs> Um, sitting, kind of drinking beer and, um, you know, chatting to each other over the Lego that um, that will not come to these kinds of things and that will start, um, well, just ignore that it, it's happening really and, and won't actually kind of um, do anything really positive about it. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a kind of preaching to the converted problem that we have to address, but I'm sure there's something we can do. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> I had a few smart asses telling me that they think we, they should have some men in tech events, yeah, but I, I just too, yeah. told them to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's all of the other That's events. All the events. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the point needs to be made that, um, as Alina said, hopefully someday we won't need gender specific events and we can just be people in tech instead of men in tech and women in tech. Mm because it's going to get to the stage where we're so segregated that um, there's almost two different industries and we're all working together on the one industry. We want this industry to flourish. We want to make money out of this industry and we want to get more girls into this industry. Um, how do you feel things like Coder Dojo and Young Rewired State and 3D Dojo all work on that? Do you think that that's a positive thing oh, to fantastic. get more girls into IT and boys, obviously, too? Yeah, Mary? definitely. Definitely. I'd like to see more of it. I'd like... I mean, I know that the government is doing a lot to support Coda Dojo and other initiatives, but I'd like to see them doing more. Yeah, definitely, it's the way to go. Mm. Uh, start with the primary school children and build from there. Yeah, I mean, I... Um, because when I first started, it was hard enough to find any kids who could code anyway, let alone um, girls. So we had one girl out of, out of the 50. She came over from France. Um, and a couple of years after that, I worked really hard to... Um, get more girls into um, uh, into young rewired state, and um, and so every time I spoke on stage, every time I wrote anything, was interviewed, I was just like, we need more girls, go and get me, you know, find the girls, bring the girls, and um, the number of girls that applied dropped because I'd shone this massive spotlight on the fact that there were no girls or that girls weren't coming or that it was, you know, it was, you know, they were the odd ones out, the ones that were coming. And so you have to be very careful that you don't make that same mistake. And actually, I talked to my 16-year-old daughter who has absolutely no interest in any of this whatsoever. And my young one does, my oldest one doesn't. And, um, and I said, how do I... Um, you know, how do I get more girls like you to actually just come along to the Festival of Code that we run every summer? And she said, just make it mainstream, stop making it so weird, mum. And, um, and so I think, and so I did, you know, I kind of tried to do everything I could to kind of, you know, get um, people that were mainstream involved in it, talking about it, that were nothing to do with technology, but we got Lily Cole to come along, and, um, and she was quite cool because she was in, what was that film where she was the, in the school film? What's that school film where she's like the head? What? St. No, Trillian's, yes, 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 where she was kind of the, So that was quite clever. And, um, and she was ace. 
and, um, and obviously, well, I am all over this space now. Um, and so, you know, kind of making it mainstream and then finding those mainstream stories and kind of um, putting that out there. And then whenever we did have um, girls coming along, we would do lots of interviews with them and we would kind of get them to talk about why they were doing it. And more often than not, they would say they were just doing it for fun. You know, they were just because they wanted something fun to do. So there's a balance there between shining this light on mm -hmm. it and making it a very an even more scary space. Yeah, for choose your role models to. carefully. You know, a local school in Derry had um, had brought along the late Jade Goody to talk to the girls there. Basically, she, when she got on the stage, she told them all that they didn't need to bother doing any qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> the teachers at the back were all crying. Yeah. So just be careful yeah. who you who you showcase. Yeah. I think um, that's one of the great things Women Who Code does is um, we showcase local stories. So girls know that you don't have to be famous to be a role model. Like the woman down the road who has mm -hmm. seen a problem and created an app is just as inspiring as Sheryl Sandberg or anyone like that because her drive and passion is equally right. just as important and as amazing. Um, I think we have to go to questions from the floor if there are any, any questions. And there's one that Where's the mic person? <laughs> uh, hello, Barry Adams here. Um, as a white heterosexual middle class male, I realize I <laughs> can't get any more privileged than I already am. Um, you know, you, you mentioned how sexism, everyday sexism thing that The Guardian, for example, has captured onto. I think it's really powerful stuff because it makes men realize that, you know, a lot of the stuff we do and say without even thinking about it is actually incredibly racist. And the thought horrifies me that this stuff might actually come out of my mouth without me realizing that it, it can be really offensive. Do you have any tips for men like me who want to stop that from happening, but just, you know, we don't know any better? Um, if you wouldn't say it to your daughter, don't say it to someone that you work with. I think that's what I would say. Um, that's a good one, any, sure. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I think Stick so. with that one, yeah, that's don't, enough. Yeah, if you wouldn't say it at home, yeah. I think um, possibly, like what you're saying, you don't realize that you're saying something that's sexist because it's just became such a common thing now to maybe pass a comment on what the way someone looks or the way she doesn't look or she doesn't look like someone else who's famous or whatever. And I think it's just, as you said, it's just became a common thing and people don't realize and they say things and they don't mean to be hurtful. But obviously, as Elena said earlier, it's those little things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I even see people talking about oh, when they're looking to hire someone and they're, we're looking for a great guy who can do rails. And I'm, okay, guy or girl. And they'll, they'll often, just because they're talking to me, correct themselves, but that's just naturally comes out of their mouth. And it's part of the, the mentality that, um, you know, just general professionalism. If you wouldn't say it to your daughter, your daughter can be an engineer too. Hmm. Any other questions? Hi, uh, the name's Anne Dargan from Rapid Change Consultancy. I don't really have a question. I kind of would like to say something, if that's okay. Um, I was a geek uh, back in the day, a long, long time ago, and um, I wasn't geek enough to do very well in an IT environment. I wasn't, you know, top-notch software engineer. I was more all-rounded. And uh, what I would uh, comment on is what has been do doing enough, I suppose, to develop women leaders? Um, as I went through my own uh, growth in the IT industry, I moved more into people-related roles. And what I found being a woman and the unconscious bias, that's a, or the gender bias that's, that's prevalent these days, is that that wasn't valued. Um, basically, I wasn't geeky enough and therefore no good. So I'd like to hear the panel's view on that and what can be done to encourage women to aspire to leadership positions. So, so this is um, something that I'm actually spending a lot of time thinking in. If anybody has any opinions on that, please see me after this. I'd love to hear them. Um, women Who Code is focusing on helping women move up I call it the startup ladder. Um, a lot of younger women aren't thinking about the next step in their career. So I'm pushing them. I'm asking them to give a tech talk. Thank you very much for having me give a talk here today. Um, I'm, has af I'm asking them to lead open source projects that our community use. Um, I'm asking them to be leaders within the organization. So after a few years, when you 
do sit back and say to yourself, okay, I'm, I am ready to take that next step. You've actually done all of these things along the way that's going to make you a better candidate um, for a senior position. Um, I also, the thing that kind of I see a lot and um, it kind of bugs me, but I don't really know what to do about it. Again, it's not one of those things I don't really know what to do about it, is that a lot of people that get into senior positions are people like me who are very forceful. I don't care if someone's saying something like that to me, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna carry on because that's where I wanna go and that's what I wanna do. But, you know, not only am I, am I kind of, you know, unusual because I'm a woman in a digital industry, but also kind of unusual because I have this thing. And um, because I'm quite, I'm quite forceful. Um, but then I actively promote and hire women and I want them to kind of follow up behind me. But there are quite a few women like me and not necessarily um, my generation, you know, often the kind of like sort of generation and a half up from me who have fought to get to the top. And, you know, they kind of smashed all those glass ceilings and done all of that. And they look at the other women that are in their organizations and they want them to fight too. And they're not gonna help them. And they're just like, you know, if you wanna be where I am, then you fight because I had to fight. And instead, and so they, you know, they're kind of often raining this glass ceiling down on all of their kind of colleagues and not helping them. And um, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to see and it's a very difficult thing to do anything about because, you know, it, you, you can't tell people like that what to do. But um, so I think that as soon as um, women get into a position of power or are doing anything like this, you know, it's, it's their role to kind of, you know, look at the people that are within the organization and encourage their skills and hire other women and kind of put them into those roles. Obviously, if they're not right for the job, then don't hire them into the job just because they're female. That's stupid. But, you know, find these women and give them the skills and kind of encourage them up with you. And I think that way we'll get, you'll be given the opportunities that you're talking about that you didn't get when you were not good enough. But you, right now you do have, um, you don't have enough women at that executive mm -hmm. level for that to be the, the tactic. Mm -hmm. I ask you all, whether you're male or female, to mm -hmm. you know, actively push a woman to take the next step in her career because mm -hmm. um, right now it, it's not enough. So we need, we need to be bringing them up on, on all level. And again, we're, we're not a minority, we're 50%. And that means we can be 50% of the leadership and we need more leaders. And so. Mm. Yeah, Madeleine Albright said that there's a special place in hell for women that don't help other women. And that's really <laughs> true. You guys know that. Um, and there's, this, there's a clear commercial reason for women being senior leaders. Half of the population and many of the buying decisions are made by women. And so if you don't have senior women in your team, you are really missing out commercially because you're not tuning into your audience properly. So there are commercial reasons for doing this as well. Can I ask you what happened to you for not being geeky enough? Actually, I did very, very well. I, I ended up uh, in very senior roles and um, had um, quite a successful career and, and now run my own consultancy company helping women in technology so it worked be out okay. effective leaders. <laughs> However, it's always a way to find... Well, the thing is that it is tough, I would say. I think the message, uh, as well as gender-specific uh, events, which I think there's a really good business case for, because they learn differently and they support each other and, and, all of, and make it a safe environment. But there's also education required across the piece, mm. so as we can all value each other's differences and work really well together. Can I just add, there's... Um Carolyn Dawson, I also work with Anne in Rapid Change, and like Anne, I come from an IT environment. I spent the first 21 years of my career as an IT professional, and so I've been through some of the same challenges that I'm sure some, some of the younger women here are facing, in that, you know, you aspire to, to be, um, a, 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 you know, to, to get promoted, to be a manager, to want to be a leader, and yet, because the environment is one that supports men, and the masculine way, it doesn't look very appealing up there when I look up there and see some of those queen bees up there that are up there, I don't see anyone that I can aspire to be like. And so no wonder women are leaving the technology area. 
And I think we, we, you mentioned a little bit earlier about the, the sexism and what we can do. Um, I know we've, we've mentioned about this thing called unconscious bias um, that women have against women as well. Um, so I think it's the, the, um, raising awareness um, amongst women and men about how we see ourselves. And you're not going to get women aspiring into leadership positions within tech or indeed any organization or sector until they can see themselves as being credible and liked within that kind of arena. Yeah, um, I think what you've pointed on there is very good. Um, one of the things when I've been to conferences before is a lot of ladies have stated that they don't want to put their hand up and be a leader because they don't want to be seen as the bitch. And it's very well known that a lot of women won't put their hand up because they don't want to be seen as either stepping on someone's toes or burning bridges that really those people on the other side of the bridge should be supporting that lady whenever she wants to step up and she wants to do something different. Is there any other questions? Over here. Over here. Um, Jason Bell, opinionated Yorkshireman. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for a, an interesting and insightful uh, panel. Um, last December, I was asked by Momentum to talk to my local high school about getting into tech and into programming. And um, the thing that came out of talking to 140 year 11, or fourth year, as I remember it, uh, kids, was um, at the end of the session, we, we asked who would be interested in taking it further. And out of the 140, 20 kids took the hand up, which was I thought was a fairly good ratio. Out of those 20 kids, four of them were girls. And when I asked a bit further into it, I said, is there any reason, reason why you think the numbers are low? Talking to them, they just said, we're just not interested. We're just not interested. So what I'd like to ask the panel really is, is there sort of one funky thing you could think of that would just really impress kids at, at year 11, year 12, and sort of the GCSE level of things, where you that's the place where you plant the seed with them that will really take them further and excite them. Um, for me personally, I'm going to say Project Spark on Minecraft. Those are excellent frameworks that don't feel like programming. They feel like you're playing a game, but again, you're learning the logic of programming. So that's where I would start personally. Any suggestions, ladies? Um, I mean, planting the seed at kind of, you know, at, at GCSE is too late. It's just too late. It's so difficult. You know, it has to be there from when they're younger because, you know, they have to go through, you know, girls going into senior school, there's just such pressure to kind of conform and to kind of, you know, be normal and, you know, fit in with everybody else that, you know, choosing to do something different. It's just, it's just too difficult. So planting a seed is, is too late. But, you know, they're interested in um, mainly becoming rich and famous. So anything that enables them to become rich and famous is going to be awesome. Um, they don't want to do anything pointless. I mean, you know, if I talk to um, Jess, my eldest, and, and all of her friends, girls and boys, you know, they're just like, we want to make stuff, but we don't want to just kind of make a thing. I mean, Tom's probably better at talking about this than me because he is a wire, so. But, um, but, you know, just so long as it's got a point, so long as it's unique, so long as there's a possibility that they're going to become either rich or famous, um, you know, mainstream. Yeah. Fun, but the seed's got to be planted earlier. I, I agree with that, but do you not think that the media portrays the picture of startups as, yeah, okay, we can say that anyone can do this, but the thing, the, the stories that we're putting out there now are WhatsApp is acquired for 19 billion. We're talking about the 0.0000002% chance of this happening to anyone on the planet. And that's the picture that we're painting to a large number of children, not just, not just girls, I mean, generally. And I found this out with my daughter that, you know, five, five pound a week pocket money ain't enough anymore. You know, it's, I want to make 10 times, 100 times that. How do I do it, Dad? You know, and, and, and it's a fair question to ask. And I, I actually agree with what you're saying that it is, at that stage it is late planting that seed. Um, what I would ask is, are we setting the bar too high and saying, yeah, we can all do startups, but we're all going to make mil you know, we're all going to be millionaires? Because that's that's an unrealistic outcome, I think. Um, it's just how to get a more rational way of doing things. 
But I, I think at a young age, it's it's still good to feel like that's an opportunity. Oh, absolutely, for you. I agree. Yeah. And to be honest, it is. We had uh, 48 more women um, become billionaires this past year, <laughs> and you know, one of those was Sheryl Sandberg. And so it it is a possibility. And even if you aren't becoming the billionaires, more women need to become. Um, startup entrepreneurs and when they do then they they will get those million dollar potentially billion dollar exits mm. yeah i mean uh, don't get me wrong one of my mentors is sat there you know i've worked with mary <laughs> hi mary um <laughs> and, and i loved working with her i learned an awful lot from mary um or was it bad <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry no it wasn't bad at all all of it bad no 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 not at all so uh, anyway th thank you thank you um, I talk to groups of school children a lot whenever I can and it's about having careers in technology but it's also about becoming startup entrepreneurs. I ask them two things. I start off by asking who in the room likes maths. <coughs> Everybody looks at their shoes and shuffles and turns away and whatever and then I say who in the room wants to earn a lot of money and all the hands go up. So it is. It's a hard sort of commercial thing but that's maybe one of the ways that you can get more people interested. I, I think there's something that, that's kind of societal that I've been looking at um, for the last six months really with the Young Rewired status and it's the kids born in 1997. So you've got digital natives that were born before that, but the kids born in 1997 um, grew up with social media from year dot, okay? So they've got access to far more information at a far younger age. So they're creating opinions um, a lot younger. Um, they also feel that they have a voice where lots of generations before them, even the digital natives, didn't necessarily mm. feel that they had a voice. These kids do. They also have grown up through recession. So their entire lives, all they can remember really is recession. So all of those safe jobs, all of those jobs that kind of you get at the career advice service are all the ones that they've seen their friends' parents and their own parents losing. You know, they don't respect bankers, they don't respect um, government, they don't want to have a safe job. The people that they see succeeding are those people that have lost their job, set up a little business, not necessarily for the exit, just employing themselves and employing their friends. And so actually, these kids have an expectation that they have a voice, they have opinions, they know that they can kind of crowdsource stuff, and they also see the safe option as entrepreneurism. So if you can actually kind of shoehorn the technology story into that, then, you know, we're winning. And these kids are now 16, 17. These kids are just about to appear on the job market and they are now looking at what they're going to do. And so from here on in, the picture is going to change quite quickly, I think. And that's why we've set up Task Squad to, You're brilliant. to accommodate the beta generation. Yeah. Um, another thing is I'm actually from the east coast of the United States, but I'm in San Francisco now. And in San Francisco, um, being an engineer is viewed as someone who can lead an organization as absolutely essential to an organization, whereas where I come from, um, engineers, they're great. It's a great career, but they're replaceable. And the managers and the people in business are the ones who are really going to be successful. And that sort of mentality is something that's going to hold back that area of, of the United States um, in, in becoming the next Silicon Valley. Uh, Tim has a question. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry, um, Andy Jarvis, another ed, um, opinionated Yorkshireman. Um, as women in tech, you are a minority, not generally, but just in tech. Do you find that people look to you as almost the voice of, of all womankind within technology? I know as a, a minority of a different ilk, I know some, sometimes people assume that what I say or when we're in conversations, oh, well, this must be what the black community thinks. You know, no, it's just what I think, really. <laughs> and if you, do you find that? And if you do, what do you do about it to, to try and change that opinion? Um, personally, I've, because in the, UK, or in the North, Northern Ireland, um, there's been nothing like women who code Belfast yet. So I've sort of been thrown into that role without even realizing it. I think as long as you make yourself clear and you always reiterate, if I'm saying a personal opinion, it is a personal opinion. I am not speaking for every woman in this room right now. Um, yes, some of them might share my view and some of them might not. I think we have to be very careful that we don't whitewash all women with the one view because then we're just as bad as the men who whitewash us with the same view. 
Mm. Any opinions? Um, I mean, no. I mean, if 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 I'm writing anything, I always make sure that that's you know that that's very clear. Um, I try not to speak because I'm not like these two amazing ladies. I don't do things specifically for women, and in fact, I kind of you know on purpose in Young We Wide State, you know, we refuse to do boy only or girl only things, just because the the um, community that we have it's important that we don't do that. Um, but I think, apart from kind of you know um, having to sort of all be, you know, assuming that what I think is what all women in technology think. It's also, the other thing that's irritating is that if you are asked to speak at a tech conference because you are a woman, mm -hmm. not because what you know about in technology and what you talk about and what you do is relevant to that conference. And so it'll be like, you know, will you come and speak at our conference? Yeah, sure. What do you want me to talk about? It doesn't matter. Just, just come and talk. And it's like, oh, it's so annoying. You go. Oh, nothing further to add. No. Tim has I, a question. I, I disagree <laughs> with that last point a little bit. Um, I a, a woman who I was at a conference um, two weeks ago, and she was like, "Oh, they always photograph me, so I could be the token Asian woman in the photograph." And I'm like, "Well, hopefully, you'll be in the photo, and next year, 20 Asian women will see your photo, and they'll say, oh, well, that's a conference for me.' And then next year, you won't be the token one." Huh. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. um, I can see what you're saying, mm -hmm. that even if you are the only lady in the picture, you're still a lady in that picture, and other women are going to look at that and think, well, maybe I can go along this year, or maybe I can <laughs> be that lady in the picture next year. Uh, do we have any more questions? One more question, and yeah. over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there's a lady there as well. Yeah. So, uh, Kira McArdle from CyberSource. Um, so, you talked there about being the token Asian lady. Um, do you, as a panel, feel that you're the token female panel in the conference? <laughs> um, I'm just looking at the rest of the speakers. So I would have liked, I guess, the women sitting on the floor here um, to be interspersed in the main panels throughout the two days instead of being kind of shoved all together at the end um, of, of, of one day of the conference. How do well, you feel about that? I was under the impression that they thought this would be a great panel, so they built a conference around it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought too. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, um, I, d I don't think we are tokenized. I think we have an important issue to discuss. We just we are females, and we all work around the same area. And it's an important issue that is important for this conference in Belfast to showcase what is happening in Belfast and the UK and what we're all doing. I don't think it's a token panel or we're token females on this panel. We are specialists in this field, and we are female. Yeah, I've I never been token anything. I'm a successful entrepreneur, full stop. Yeah. Huh. yeah. I, I do. I do normally say no to um, women in technology panels. I said yes because I love this lady. <laughs> I think she's amazing, um, and also because you know this is something very new that is happening here. Um, but in London, I get asked all the time, and I say no yeah. because it is just. Yeah, I agree that you're all technologists in your own right, but that's why I would have liked you speaking kind of throughout the day as opposed to. Um, yeah. All so space. I actually have. Um, a weekly newsletter that I send out to women who code globally. And um, so conferences and hackathons are always asking me to include it in the newsletter. And I say, okay, sure, but do you have women speakers? Do you have um, women judges, presenters? And it actually they say, oh, wow, yeah. Well, can you recommend one? And I'm like, well, here's 10 names. Why don't you, why don't you have one of them? Um, or three of them, or half of them. <laughs> um, I've also had similar issues in mm -hmm. that people want me to promote their things, and that's totally fine. But again, they haven't mm -hmm. even possibly thought about having a female speaker. Or mm -hmm. And it's great now that Women Who Code exists because we are a resource to help people mm -hmm. find female speakers and female specialists in all these different areas. Last question. Hi, um, Hi. I'm Tim. Um, prompted by Jason to say something that might be, might be controversial in that I don't believe that there is an underrepresentation of, of female scientists and engineers in tech. I think it depends on what we mean by tech. So if we look across, I mean, if we look at, at early career um, researchers, certainly the data would show, certainly in the UK, that there's, there is... Um, there's no significant difference in the number of early career researchers, male and female researchers, in the UK working in science and engineering disciplines once you add all of those things up. 
when you look at um, the pharmaceutical industry um, in particular, there is a higher number of, of female scientists and engineers in um, working in, 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 that, in those fields. Um, and indeed, once you, you step further out into bioengineering, you step out into in genetic engineering and biotechnology, again, you've got a higher number of, 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 of female scientists and engineers working in those types of companies. And indeed, when you look at the sea level people in those technology industries, you've got a, a very, very good representation of, or a very, very good mix of, of male and female people at that, at that level. This problem, and it is a problem, appears to be in small to medium size um, IT and digital media companies. It's not something that's prevalent elsewhere in the technology industry. Um, certainly from the, from the data in, in, in the UK. Now, it's about the companies, I think. It's not about the technology. It's a problem. And, and you know, these companies are, are designed by people. They're, their, their organizational design is all, all, all about those people. It's a, the problem is right there. It's not, it doesn't appear to be a, a technology problem. It's, a, it's an enterprise problem. <clears throat> well, um, you know, we, we heard a qu quote earlier that, um, you know, are short 44,000 engineers um, for jobs here in the United Kingdom. And women are only representing 19% of that, so we are 51% of the population. And just to get closer to bridge that gap of 44,000, if we just get an, a, women to be representative, then you're going to get closer to, to bridging that gap. But, it, yeah. yeah, I mean, it is specifically in technology and in the digital space. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you widen the net, you know, exponentially, you're eventually going to manage to balance the books. But you can't get away from the fact that in engineering, there is a very big gap. And that gap starts age seven. So it is an issue. I think it's the choices that people make at, at, at school is, is, is all part of this. Whether people are going into the pharmaceutical industries or other areas in tech, or IT and, and, and engineering, but but certainly when when you look at the the patent filings um, of early career researchers right across um, right across the UK, which would give you a feel for who the innovators are. Um, again, there's no significant difference between male and female innovators at that age, um, based on on that 50 51 percent. The problem is all condensed, it seems, all down into, into IT and, and digital media, and, and the digital mm. media companies, mm. for some reason, which... Maybe. I mean, you know, there is also the issue with kind of, um, you know, working and flexible working mm. and la la la, all of those things, and those are gonna start to make a big difference. I mean, I can never go to a breakfast meeting, ever, ever, um, especially not a breakfast meeting in London. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of time that's where deals are done. So, yes, corporates, yes, the way deals are done. Um, and that's probably not just tech industry, you know, that's probably across the board, but, um, you know, that's a kind of slightly different yeah. problem. It is very, very hard work being in a tech startup. There's no getting away from that. It's 364 days a year, and a lot of women can't commit to that. Oh. So it excludes them. Do we have any more questions? Is that the last question? La that's us, okay. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to my panel and for giving me your time, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.